from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am Bob Spangler from the National Archives, and um, the, um, for this hour, we're going to focus on practical approaches to accessioning and processing email, which I think is a nice follow-up to the technical discussion we just had. So we, we went into the weeds a little bit on the technology of things, and now we're going to talk about how to implement these sort of things. Um, each of our speakers will present, as in the last format, for around 15 minutes, and then we will follow with a quick uh, Q&A, uh, just the way we did last time. Uh, our team has the uh, coveted pre-lunch spot, so um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get through it, though. It'll be fine. Um, I will introduce all these folks right now in the order in which they will uh, speak, the same way that Kate did with the last group. Um, Roger Christman is Roger the Machine from the <laughs> last um, presentation, <laughs> so that should be interesting. Um, who is the senior state records archivist of the Library of Virginia, and, and um, we're looking forward to that presentation. April Cook McKay is the lead archivist for university collections development at the University of Michigan, and um, she spent five hours on the runway last night in Detroit, I think it was five hours, um, before landing here at around 1.30 in the morning, so give me a signal if you want me to go get coffee for you or something in the middle of your presentation. And Dorothy Waugh, who I just met, is the Digital Archives Project Archivist from Emory University. And we just had a nice conversation about um, beautiful Emory University in Atlanta, where one of my kids attended. So that was my, uh, that was my point in common with, with Dorothy. So we're looking forward to this. Um, so we're going to start with, with Roger. And um, let welcome to the machine, Roger. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I thought I'd pick up uh, a couple of questions left from uh, Kathy's presentation. Uh, this, going back to the Style Weekly re uh, reporter, he apparently doesn't have the same filthy mouth that Kathy and I have because we found a lot of more dirty words in there than he was able to find, so I'm not sure what his vocabulary is like. <laughs> and or what that says about us, perhaps. Uh, and the last question about uh, the Don, formerly of the Library of Virginia, asked uh, about the McDonald transfer and, and the comparison between Kane. Kane, we got 1.3 million or so emails. Uh, McDonald was 6 million. And we expect probably that much, if not more, from the McAuliffe administration. So this just never ends. Uh, I thought I'd just sort of just jump right in. Uh, when we decided to put this, uh, the Kane administration email online, there was sort of an expectation because we had worked with the records creators for managing their material, what to keep, what not to keep, that we're gonna, it'll be perfect. We'll have this wonderful collection and we'll be able to just jump right in. And this is just an example that they shared with their staff and it's not very, with the screen so small. What I mean, gives them all the procedures and what to do, what to keep, what not to keep, et cetera. But uh, yeah, that didn't work out very well in the end. Here's an example of them. on the left is one that you know, we gave them a recommended sort of uh, filing system based on the retention schedule, and this person here was the Deputy Secretary, uh, Gail Jaspin of, of Health and Human Resources, and she had a nice, wonderful structure, but what you see on the right is what, where it just says everything's in sent items, like 3,000. There was one where it was like 15,000. It was all in the sent file. So we decided that it's like, all right, we're going to, as, as Kathy talked about in the reasons, that we're going to have to go ahead and do, uh, by putting this online, we're going to have to do uh, item level uh, appraisal and review. And just like with the technical stuff, we did the appraisal and processing on the fly. Uh, this is just the, the draft guide that I had started putting together for, for processing the records. And it was a lot of trial and error just going through and trying to look not only at their retention schedule for the Office of the Governor, but look at the general retention schedules. 
and it was, it, it just took a very long time. We had fits and starts uh, where we would come across things that, you know, it wasn't clear uh, and a great level of, is this a record? Should this be restricted, et cetera? And uh, the biggest example was the attorney client. The, the, the lawyers in the administration had flagged things that were attorney client, but other receivers of those records did not. And if we're gonna put all this online, how do we reconcile that? So silly me, I asked our AG rep, like, what is the, the boundaries of who's the actual client? Is it the governor? Is it anyone in the administration? Uh, what's the definition? Uh, there were things that were flagged attorney client that were like newspaper articles and they, they wasn't providing legal advice. <laughs> so I did ask Larry Roberts about some of that stuff and he said, yeah, when I went through this stuff, it was just more about the subjects, not necessarily the content of each individual email. So where everything's on hold and the Attorney General's office comes back with an opinion that stunned us all and said the counselor does not have attorney-client privilege. Only in, the only people in Virginia who can provide legal advice are the office of the Attorney General or a designated special counsel. So therefore, all the things they had flagged as attorney-client is now open. So it's like, oh crap, I gotta go back and do this again <laughs> and review this stuff. So the things between you know, the attorney general's office and the counselors, that would be attorney client, but all the things they had flagged uh, with emails between the governor and the counselors is now all open. And uh, Larry Roberts was not happy when I told him that. I mean, uh, uh, not getting too partisan here, but he, he said that was like one of the one of many mistakes that our attorney general at the time, Ken Puccinelli, did that uh, was really detrimental. And, but it was good that we had this, this relationship and he didn't like it, but as he said, you know, we didn't do anything wrong. It's just it was more about the, the principle that, you know, the, that the governor needs an independent counsel like that. And he just didn't have it. Oh, now this is the numbers that, just to give you a, a, of a sense, uh, we were talking about restricted material and one of the big ones that has been talked about is personally identifiable information. Uh, that's not our biggest challenge as, as Kathy and I like to say, it's not PII, it's POO. That's the problem in these collections. There's, uh, think about that, wait a minute. <laughs> wait for it, okay. Uh, if you see on this chart, just to show, I know it's really small, but you'll get the picture that 138,000 total emails from the executive office, which was about 15 people, 47,000 of those were non-records or non-permanent record, or non-permanent archival records. The Commonwealth one, there's two, over 200,000 email records, 198,000 of them aren't. So that's our biggest problem is not so much the uh, personal identification stuff, it's all this other stuff that they sent over despite our, our encouragement and urgings not to keep that stuff in there, that stuff came over and we have to deal with it. Now, as Kathy said, that's another reason why we haven't really dealt with preservation. Uh, we don't need to uh, preserve the emails, though they're very uh, entertaining about people's love lives and uh, they ran an American Idol pool. I wasn't aware of that. Where you know, like not, they did the NCA, we felt pretty good. Uh, they did the office pool for the NCA bracket. You know, the, uh, so that was great. But. We don't really need that stuff. And what we've really learned from this and have, have passed on uh, sort of in a records management way is just get the stuff out. That it's either personal, the list serve stuff, uh, or just you know, going to lunch, get that stuff out and we can handle the rest. They don't have time to sit there and go through and categorize, you know, we came up with this lovely file system. It works in theory, it's not gonna happen. It's, we're just not gonna, we're just gonna have to accept what we get and go through with it and that's what we've been trying to, to focus on. We uh, were at the first cabinet meeting for the McAuliffe administration and we had 10 minutes and that was our main message, get rid of the crap. Just, that's it from there, don't even, I mean, that's all you can do at that point. And for processing this stuff, you know, as Kathy said, we wanted to be, have a, web, uh, a website that was transparent, like the little section with Tim Kaine and like the little clown car there, uh, look under the hood. We also wanted to be able to have a section where we put the processed records in context with the other records as well, that it's not just the, the email that you're looking at. So we did the section 
for related content because one of the things that, that I think is very important when you're dealing with a large amount of email is, is how do you describe it and so you know where to find things uh, is really you need to know more about how the office worked and what each individual's responsibilities were. That can be a helpful guide to direct users to search in a particular box as opposed to doing a global search of several hundred thousand emails and trying to, to nail it down. So we did this sort of org chart based on the email itself where they talked about who was doing what, what their responsibilities were. And we also would have links to paper finding aids, uh, other born digital material, videos, uh, web ar archived websites, et cetera, to give the user a better, uh, a better guide as to where to look for things. Uh, we also did a finding aid as well, and we did a description. I didn't really, I mean, I hadn't done this before, so I just created the people who were in the executive office. That's just that series one, and then we, the sub-series was each person, and then we described it at each PST level as to uh, what was in there, you know, sub on subject headings, any sort of notable juicy emails that people might want to focus on, uh, the, the people who were emailing the governor or whoever was in that box in the date range. And we felt this was important because records can be in many different places. Like if you just looked at a basic description of Tim Kaine's email files, there's nothing that exists before April 2007. He processed his own, e he, his own email before it, was came, it came over and he couldn't find it and it was corrupted, it was gone. So I could say, oh, there's only email between this place and you know, from May 2007 uh, to 2010. It's not accurate to say that, oh, we don't have any email from that period for Tim Kaine. There's none in his box, but it's in everyone else's box and you need to start thinking in a different way. And that's what this chart and the description is about, is to get you to think uh, in different ways as to where, might things be, where things might be found. And Kathy had mentioned the blind copy feature that you could show that, because there's some very uh, contentious emails between uh, Kane's chief of staff and deputy chief of staff. Uh, they're really going at it, they're really having a, a real throw down fisticuffs. The emails about that, one of them blind copied Larry Roberts and it's in there, the other two deleted it out of there. So you really have to think differently when you uh, go through this stuff. Uh, the other aspect, you know, if you build it, will they come? And what we decided to do early on in addition to this was I've written a series of, of posts uh, highlighting various aspects of what you can find in the collection, whether it be all the work that went into, and the federal people might like, like this, all the work that went into having President Obama call into Tim Kaine's last Ask the Governor call, you would think that would, a 30 second call wouldn't take that much work, but there's an entire string going back and forth to arrange him to call in, and he was, he's like Barry from DC, it was December of 2009, so just to try to give people a, a sense of the type of content. This, the, the content in here is relevant to things that are going on today. I did one on uh, Virginia's budget. Uh, in 2014, Virginia was in danger of not having a budget by the end of the fiscal year. And that nearly happened in Tim Kaine's administration and they had gamed out what they were gonna do and it was in the email and I did a post on it and uh, a reporter from the Newport News uh, Daily Press also did an article about that based on that. So we're trying to get the, get the word out there that we have this stuff and that we're not just, it makes us relevant is how I view it. It's that the, the library isn't a place, you know, the old dusty records that we have content now that is relevant to political and governmental and policy discussions right now. And even though this took a while to go through, I think I reviewed, uh, one other colleague, Ben Romley, reviewed about 20,000. I think I went through about 400,000 and it's not always pretty, but it, at the end of the day, I think it makes us relevant strategically as an institution to try to get this stuff out. And yep, and these are just the, the links I had at the end here. I don't think I had anything else. Oh, I know what I meant to talk about. Oh, never mind. We're just going to take this down. 
I had mentioned this in, in the, the Q&A that we had talked about. When we put this stuff online, one of the key items was to have a relationship with the records creators, to put them at ease, to keep the lines of communication open. By, you know, Kathy had mentioned this, by putting this out there online for anyone to look at, we had a certain responsibility. We didn't have to do any of this. We could have said, hey, it's ours, we're putting it out there. But it's pretty stupid not to, because what we do affects our relationship with the office of the governor, not just the individuals who were in a previous administration. And if we did not handle this properly, they were not, other governors would not trust us with their material. So it was very important to offer them the opportunity to review the stuff. They don't get veto power. They could point things out, and if, if we agree, we can either agree to disagree, we can get the attorney general's office to help us with that. Uh, but it, that, that was really the, the key to have that relationship, and it's benefited us in other ways that now Senator King has already approached us about his Senate records as well. I mean, he's asking at the beginning about his electronic records and email, and that we're, we're capturing his, uh, through archive at his social media sites. He's being proactive at the beginning because he gets it, he, and we have this relationship with him. And it's something we try to do with with each governor as they leave, just to keep those lines of communication open. Uh, part of what having it was because the Senate, we thought we might be releasing some of the Kane stuff before the, the 2012 general election in November. Uh, yeah, that came and went because we had so many other issues to, uh, to deal <coughs> with. But for the future, Kathy mentioned this as well about the man versus machine. Uh, my money's on the machine. I'm praying it's the machine because I don't want to have to do this again. <laughs> So go machine go. Uh, but I think that in the end, it was worth doing all this because we wouldn't have, I mean, the man versus machine project is going to take, it would admittedly is part art, part science of what I did and try to recreate it automatically, automating it. And if they could cut down, you know, it's not gonna be perfect, we all know that, I mean, because it's judgment calls on some of these, these records. But you have a control now to try something against, and that alone, if that can be beneficial to, to others for moving the ball forward, I mean, that's how we sort of take it, just we do what we can, and it's opened up these opportunities for us that we didn't think we had before. So, I, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm from a university, and I think um, one of the things all of you government archivists might, um, might appreciate after this talk is that there are some things that are easier for you than they are out sort of where it's a little bit more loosey-goosey, um, you know, where there's a, more uh, ability to, to handle things in a, in a diverse way and um, maybe less enforcement power um, for your records management policies. So uh, I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'll just give you a little bit of background about the University of Michigan. Our budget is $7 billion a year. We have 14,000 staff members. We have um, 43,000 students. We have 19 schools and colleges and a very decentralized model. We're currently gearing up to celebrate the bicentennial of 2017. And at the Bentley Historical Library, where I work, we hold the university's archives. And so we're interested in gathering records of enduring significance. My role on, at, at the archives is I'm the lead archivist for University of Michigan Collections Development, so I'm the field archivist for the university collections. Um, we do not currently have a university records manager. So there is nobody who fills that function, although we're hoping very soon to have one. Um, so to the extent that there's somebody on campus who advises units about records management, um, I'm the person who does that. So I'd like to tell you about an email-related project that we conducted several years ago now. 
this project has technical aspects, it has archival aspects, it has records management aspects, it has policy aspects. That's one of the reasons I'm so thrilled about the way this conference today is, is, is structured because I think basically you can't think about email without thinking about all those things because you, know, you can't mandate that somebody does something unless you give them a tool to be able to carry out your instructions. So I think that the technical aspect and the policy aspects are very um, intertwined. But because I'm sitting here in the middle of this archives section, I'm going to um, focus on that area. I could tell you stories with all different lenses on our project. but. Um, so I'm going to focus on the uh, on a very practical part of the archival project that we um, that we worked on. So back in 2008, when this project started, our electronic records archivist Nancy Deromedy had figured out how to responsibly manage um, some very important record series that were born digital, but um, the workflow for each of those kinds of record series was very customized. And we knew we needed a more streamlined, more sustainable practice, but the path forward was not really very clear. So we had some rudimentary storage space, no repository software to manage it, just sort of EAD finding aids with links to where um, the materials were stored, no local IT department. We just had two archivists who'd sort of learned how to do IT on the job. Um, digital records were processed on desktops, for example. Um, so our director, Fran, Fran Bluen, decided to focus on the record type that he saw as, uh, that, as being sort of crucial. We already knew that with the advent of email, Dean's records, um, the, the, the correspondence of the Dean's offices, of the director's offices, of the executive officers of the university were no longer being transferred to us in such well-ordered discipline files as they had been before. And this left an important gap in the historical record of the, of the university. So Fran began talking to the Mellon Foundation about funding a project to capture email um, at the university, at the university's top decision-making level, levels. So the heterogeneity, this is what I was talking about a little, a little bit before, the heterogeneity of the email services in 2008 on the campus is, is like, impossible to imagine. Um, the university maintained an IMAP email server that provided accounts for students and staff. A central IT unit provided desktop support for many different email applications. And so I saw there was a there was an email there was a slide earlier about, you know, way back in the day we used Pine. Well people were still using Pine until very recently at the University of Michigan. Pine, Mulberry, Apple Mail, Thunderbird, we had two homegrown applications. You could choose what you wanted to use. Um, you could choose one email at your desktop and one email on your home computer. You could, you know, everybody had personal devices. But this was not a, the extent of the fragmentation at the University of Michigan because units within the university have a high degree of autonomy and several schools and colleges had decided that they would re really rather have Outlook Exchange and so they created their own exchange servers. But each school and college had their own exchange server and they were upgraded on different schedules. So one might be on, a, on, a, on the new version and the other one might be two versions back. They wouldn't move forward at the same time. They couldn't talk to each other. There was no shared calendaring between the law school and the school of LSNA, for example. And so we just, this, this situation was, was happening like this for, for years and years, and we didn't see it getting better. And so at some point, we just said, we have to start doing something, and we have to figure out how to, how to, how to capture some of this email. So we formed a collaborative project um, with this goal to allow executives to identify email messages of long-term value and transfer them to a secure record-keeping system accessible by archivists. So the Bentley, which again had no IT department of its own, partnered with one of the central IT units, which had expertise in a sort of assessing commercial software, adapting off-the-shelf um, solutions, and providing access management, security, hardware, and software maintenance, that kind of thing. So, um, at that point, that's when I started to work on the project. Um, and after preliminary talks with the Mellon Foundation, we knew that they would welcome a grant proposal, so we started to work on the grant proposal at the same time as we started to work on functional requirements for an email archiving system. 
we created the most beautiful set of functional requirements. Oh, it was such a beautiful set of functional requirements. We created this beautiful RFP. We saw presentations from Documentum and from FileNet and from various kinds of um, uh, enterprise content management systems. We probably, if we, you know, we, we, thought, we thought Documentum looked beautiful. We also saw ImageNow, which is another uh, sort of imaging technology that you can sort of sometimes sort of make it do um, records management functionality, um, content management. So, but unfortunately, at that point, it was sort of the bottom of the economic disaster in Michigan, right? Um, so, after seeing the, the, what the, after seeing the presentations, we knew that if we were going to uh, manage email as a record based on content, not just as a format, we would need to buy an enterprise content management system. But it was such a bad time to think about procuring a system like that. And, um, and anyway, the systems really only did a very good job if you wanted to know what the folders were that the things were kept in with, with Outlook Exchange. So if you didn't use Outlook Exchange, it wasn't going to be able to handle very well all of the IMAP material that we were also trying to manage that, um, that, was al that also carried university records. So we decided to shift gears and consider an interim approach. Um, that captured important email and allowed for the development of strategic solution for content management. So um, this is what we came up with. It, in, in both Out, Outlook Exchange and IMAP-based email, email accounts, we came up with a way to create a second email account that was shared with shared access by the executive, an archivist, and, a, uh, and the administrative assistant for that executive. And the executive could identify email messages, and we could see whether or not actually declaring messages as being archival would actually fly. Because if you're going to use Documentum, you need to have uh, people need to declare records, or you need to at least identify folders of, of information that has record content. And probably all of you in, in the government um, work with this kind of uh, strategy all the time, but this is less familiar for us to have it be automatically harvested from an email account. So we set up 11 pilot accounts with various university executives, and this was like mid-2010 by that point. They were all people who were our big fans. They were all people who had warm and fuzzy feelings about the archives, so we knew that they would try hard to, um, to archive important messages on the fly. So how did it work? It didn't work. So, of the 11 accounts, that we had one user who managed to transfer 2,500 messages. That was a huge legacy account. Um, the, the, the median in our sample of 11 users was 68 messages over an 18-month period. And this is a $300,000 project. So when you consider um, the time and effort required to do training and desktop support at the people's desktop, it was definitely not worth this effort on a per message basis. Why were the results so low? Well, we interviewed our users and here are some of the reasons that they told us. Actually, it's difficult to predict the significance of a message at the time of writing it because some things start one way and they end up being much more significant over time. I'm worried about the third-party privacy and confidentiality issues. I wanted to do a thorough s review of my legacy email for transfer, but didn't even ever find the time. I guess I just don't. I, ju I guess I just do much less business of significance over email than I thought. <laughs> Some of our respondents said the system worked exactly as they'd ex they had hoped it would, and none of them said it was too difficult to use. But these were our conclusions. Dis despite the best of intentions, executives would not, cannot reliably target messages for the archives on the fly. And that, I don't know, maybe that seems obvious to us, but you know, for the people that we're asking for stronger policy from, it maybe wasn't so obvious to them. And so to have data in our, in our pockets that say, you know, this actually doesn't work um, is actually very useful. Um, a successful system would capture larger chunks of data by folders, by time periods, and require less effort from the archivists um, and less effort from the executives themselves. And thirdly, and this was most important, we, needed, we need stronger, better policy. Um, we need to specify the types of email that should be kept and highlight, 
highlight the executive's responsibilities to render them to the university in an orderly way. It turned out that the decision to do this test in this way was an incredibly good one because, as I said, if we'd have chosen Documentum or FileNet or one of those other content management systems and expected people to nominate records for, for that system, we would have had the same result. And so this is, has really expanded our thinking and it has allowed us to argue for accessioning, as in the CERT project, the entire archive, the entire accumulation of email at the end of um, uh, an executive's tenure in office, or at least in a time period of, a, of a, a chunk of a few years or so, instead of trying to do it messages on the fly. So while we were toiling away at our project, the university uh, had decided to finally fix its IT prob problems. Okay. And, um, combine all of the IT units on campus. This created an enormous upheaval uh, as staff were let go, as supervisors shifted their portfolios three or four times and so on. So the next decision that university made during the term of our grant was to move to cloud-based email services from that diversity that I showed you before. So they decided, you know, first there's this decision we're going to move to cloud-based email, then it was like, let's look at Microsoft and Google and compare them, and then it was like, yes, we're going to Google, and then finally it was the period of time that we're actually moving all of our email to Google. So by the end of our research term, we, all of the university's email had moved into uh, Gmail. So. And at that point, there weren't any really good tools for even creating inbox files out of Gmail accounts because you had to sort of, at the desktop, you would have to install Thunderbird and have two accounts be affiliated and then have all of the email be copied over to a Thunderbird account and then download the inbox files. So basically at that point, we took a step back and said, we're gonna work on other priorities for a little while until we get to the point where, um, where we can take another look at email again. And since then, we've started to experiment a little bit more with um, Google Takeout, which we're very pleased with the way that it's working as far as creating um, inbox accounts. Um, we're in current talks with the general counsel's office about revising the records management um, policies with regard to email. Um, but that's a difficult conversation because there's a balance of risk between keeping it in the archives. Um, um, there's costs on both sides to, and risks to the university because we can't afford to do the item-based um, analysis uh, and weeding that was uh, we just learned about from the from the Library of Virginia. We we just don't have the staff to be able to do that. So, um, do can we take email in large accounts that then we have to keep closed for 75 years because we can't uh, we can't look at uh, we can't remove the student records out of it. Um, and so it would always need to go through a FOIA office in order to be able to have the uh, records be made available. So in short, we made a huge effort on email for several years without making headway, and we've decided to step back and work on other things, as I said. I'm hoping to hear where all of you guys um, have gotten, and I hope you have more success. Um, I, I, we are to the point, we weren't at the point at the beginning that we could um, walk up to somebody's desktop and say, here, you know, we have all the tools we need to download your account in um, and preserve it. And now we are to the point where we can do that. Um, so I feel like we, we know how to package it, we know how to store it, um, but we don't, it's still not coming to us, it's still extracting it from the silos of people's individual email accounts is still a really difficult challenge and I don't know how we're, how we're gonna go forward and I hope to have lots of ideas from you all, so. Thank you very much. Um, I published two campus case studies on, on this that are um, on the SAA website if you'd like to take a look. It has all of our technical specs there too, exactly what our metadata schemas are and um, the tools that we use to extract the data and stuff like that. So um, I hope you'll take a look. Thank you.
Hello. Um, so I'm Dorothy Wall, um, and I'm part of the Digital Archives team at Emory University's Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library, or MARBLE, um, where email is fast becoming an ubiquitous part of our special collections, not on, on a much smaller scale than some of the examples you've heard about this morning, but um, nevertheless. So I'd like to begin by taking a look at the abstract that Erin sent me for this session and explaining a little bit about how it helped me to shape my talk. So when Erin sent me this extract, I sat down to read it and I got exactly this far and I thought, oh, I know the collection I'm going to tell you about. Um, because if you want challenges, I've got the collection for you. Um, I think the final line of this abstract really nicely summarizes what I hope to discuss. So in the, this Boots on the Ground topic track, archivists will present lessons learned, including real life challenges and success stories. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about email that we received as part of the Lucille Clifton papers. Um, Lucille Clifton was a poet and a writer. She wrote a number of children's books. And as part of her collection, we received her personal computer, um, five floppy disks, her video writer, which you see on the screen here, um, and her email. Processing of these Born Digital materials was completed earlier this year, and in addition to her other Born Digital files, we currently have roughly 2,500 email and attachments imperfectly available to our researchers via dedicated laptops in our reading room, so a much smaller scale, as I said. So what do I mean by imperfectly available? Well, to answer that question, I'll get stuck right into challenge number one. The email that we received as part of the Lucille Clifton collection came to us from two different sources, one of which were um, local PFC files stored on the hard drive of Clifton's personal computer. So PFC stands for Personal Filing Cabinet. Um, it's a filing system used by AOL's desktop software that stores your email on your computer's hard drive so that you can read it when you're offline. It's a proprietary AOL format, and therein lies the rub. Getting the data out of the PFC files on Clifton's computer proved to be quite challenging. Um, there are quite a few email migration tools out there, as I'm sure you know, but I had a hard time finding one that could deal with AOL's PFC format. After some searching, I did come across a couple of free tools, um, including the appealingly named AOL Dump, which <laughs> converts PFC files to Mbox files. And while these tools were useful in as far as they did allow me to access and appraise the content of the PFC file, the actual migration functionality was a bit shaky. I was able to access the content, but as you probably cannot see, um, it was, I wasn't able to produce a clean and user-friendly copy. Um, my digging for an alternative solution continued. So eventually I ended up reaching out to archivists at the University of Manchester in the UK, um, who, have who have preserved over 200,000 email and 65,000 attachments from the Carsonet Press collection. And they recommended a tool called Emailchemy, um, which I'm sure some of you may be familiar with, as one of the few tools that's able to handle AOL's PFC files. Like AOL Dump, Emailchemy allows you to convert PFC files to Mbox, um, and it will actually read a number of different email formats and write to several different formats, but we've only really used it for this purpose up to now. Once we have the Mbox, we're using Aid for Mail to um, extract PDF copies of emails. And of all the email migration tools that I have explored, I found Aid, to Mail, Aid for Mail to be one of the most useful. It supports a range of email formats, with the unfortunate exception of AOL's PFC format. Um, and it can export email attachments and associated metadata to a range of formats, um, one of which, the MHT Web Archives file format, uses Internet Explorer to simulate um, something like an email application. And this is an option that we're exploring as a possible access option for future collections. Um, unfortunately, the challenges associated with this collection meant that it wasn't really an option here. On the whole, Emailchemy and Aid for Mail um, have allowed us to get clean PDF copies of email, one of which you see here, which use the original subject line as the file name and which maintain the original sent date out of those proprietary AOL PFC files. And so, on to challenge number two. 
So I said earlier that Clifton's email came to us from two different sources. The first being the locally stored PFC files that I just discussed. Um, we also, in 2011, acquired email from Clifton's current live AOL account. Email stored on client servers presents a different set of challenges from locally stored copies, not least the fact that the account will be password protected and options for export limited to what the specific email client will allow. At this point, sadly, Lucille Clifton had passed away. Um, and if she had been the only person to know her AOL password, this could have prevented us from ever getting access to this email. Luckily, Clifton's daughter was able to provide us with the password, and there'll be more on that when I get to challenge three. Once we had access, email was exported to a Marble Gmail account that we had set up for that purpose. So the lesson learned here is that this is probably not the best way to transfer email from a live account, if avoidable. Um, there were some advantages to doing it this way. Uh, we preserved the original formatting of the emails, and we preserved most attachments, as far as we know. Um, however, there were also some significant disadvantages to using this method of transfer. The email transferred to our Marble Gmail account remained there until processing began in earnest earlier this year. Um, oh, sorry, at the end of 2014, actually. And um, while no data was lost, this meant we were relying on Google servers for three years rather than having a robust preservation strategy in place. Um, in other words, this was really a step sideways rather than a step forward in terms of preservation. The email client that we had to deal with had changed, but the conditions under which the email was stored remained very similar. And this is not a strategy that we will use moving forward. Having transferred the email to the Marble Gmail account, we used Aid for Mail to export PDF access copies of the email and any attachments. So to recap, we have email migrated to PDF from local AOL PFC files using email Alchemy and Aid for Mail. And we have email migrated to PDF from Clifton's active AOL account via the Marble Gmail account and Aid for Mail, which brings us to challenge number three. Lucille Clifton and her daughter shared an email account. I think this is an area where the promotion of good digital, personal digital archiving practices is really important. Um, shared accounts, whether it's a user account on a PC, an email account, or a social media account, are really problematic, both for our users and for us. Um, and this is certainly an issue that I try to address whenever anyone gives me the opportunity to speak about personal digital archiving. So this meant that my first task was separating Lucille's email from her daughter's. And of course, we had two goals in doing this. One was ensuring that as much of Lucille's email would be made available to researchers as was possible. The other was protecting her daughter's privacy and not inadvertently releasing her email in the process. Aid for Mail does provide some filtering functionality. And initially, I did play around with that to see if I could somehow automate this sorting process. However, I didn't feel confident that I could identify a list of keywords that would capture a comprehensive portion of Lucille's mail without also including her daughter's. One key reason for this is the very informal nature of email. It's not uncommon for no addressee to be, ever be identified in the message, meaning that Lucille's name, for example, might never be mentioned in the body of an email. And similarly, the wide-ranging content made it really difficult to define a really comprehensive list of keywords. So as a result, I did this sorting manually. Perhaps I cut my losses too soon here. I wonder if I had just persevered a little bit longer, I might have eventually identified some combination of keywords that could have got me close to a more automated sort. Um, but the upside of this otherwise time-intensive approach was that I didn't have to think about strategies for the identification of private or sensitive data since I was reviewing every file anyway. Um, I could also use this as an opportunity for quality control work, looking for any problems caused by the migration process, which was important given that this was our first time using these tools. Obviously, and in spite of my determined attempts to see a silver lining, this was a lengthy process. And while it did become easier to identify mail as I began to associate certain people and subjects with either Lucille or her daughter, there certainly remained a handful of email that I was unable to identify with certainty. For the most part, these were fairly innocuous, and I was able to take my best guess without risking private information. But even so, it all took quite a long time. But I did finish eventually, and once I did, I was on to my next challenge, 
uh, challenge four, how best to deliver email to our researchers. So I think we're all accustomed to viewing email via an email client, typically with a correspondence separated into various folders on the left-hand side of the page, email listed chronologically in some built-in search functionality. And finding some way to replicate this structure in order to provide access to email should be the goal, I think. It's practical and it helps preserve some of the context provided by the original digital environment. And this is what makes the MHT web archive files format that I mentioned earlier so interesting. But in light of the challenges associated with this collection, a series of PDF files seemed like our best imperfect option, which still left a few questions like, what to do with attachments. Because we had two sets of email originating in two different places, we ended up with two sets of email that behaved slightly differently. And one such difference was how they dealt, or more to the point, did not deal with attachments. So no attachments were preserved amongst the email migrated from the AOL PFC files at all. Um, links to attachments in the PDFs exported from the Marble Gmail account worked intermittently. So I used Aid for Mail to export the attachments from the Marble Gmail account to PDF. I popped both the attachment and its associated email into a folder named using the email subject line. I felt this approach got me sort of just a little bit closer to something that replicates the way a native email application would deliver email and attachments. Another question related to the delivery of these email, and that was dates. By default, most email applications list email by date, and I felt strongly that this email should be um, arranged similarly, but here's the thing. You remember when we exported Clifton's email from her active AOL account to the Marble Gmail account? Well, that changed the dates of every single email and attachment to the date on which that migration took place. Should have seen it coming. I was unable to find a way to automate the process of correcting these dates. Uh, my solution, therefore, was to manually and painstakingly change each date and time one by one. Um, I suspect that there is a better way of doing this. Um, and if anyone knows what the better way might be, I would love to hear from you. Um, so at this point, I thought I was there. It had been a long and at times grueling adventure, but the data had at last been transferred, it had been migrated, and it was arranged ready for researcher access. And it wasn't perfect, but I had done what I could to present the collection in such a way that tried to maintain the, the significant characteristics of the material as best I could given its limitations. And this is how it looked. So there was an inbox and a sent folder, and each one contained a list of email arranged chronologically um, with any emails that had attachments stored together in a folder. At least this is how it looked on my processing machine, which is a Mac. Which brings us to challenge 4C, <laughs> Microsoft Windows. Because the reading room laptops that researchers use to access our born digital collections are Windows machines. And here is how the same arrangement looks on a Windows machine. You can see that Windows Explorer by default lists all folders first, followed by the remaining files. And after much wrangling and searching and help from our brilliant desktop support team, we resigned ourselves to the fact that this can't be changed. They are, as I said, imperfectly available. So my final challenge was description. In the process of preparing these materials for access, we made a lot of decisions that had an impact on how they are accessed. And one of the questions that developed out of this work was how best to communicate those decisions to our researchers. Our current solution has been to include a processing note in the finding aid that outlines what we consider the steps most pertinent to our researchers. For example, it's important for our researchers to know how the migration process may have affected the formatting of access copies, how we have chosen to deal with attachments, how the two sets of email differed in terms of what they preserved. The question that this raises, of course, is whether researchers actually read notes in finding aids. Um, and I'm not altogether sure they do. And while this might not be a problem specific to digital archives or email, I think it does warrant some reassessment of how best we can describe these collections to um, our researchers, given their particular characteristics and needs. So to conclude, it's important to note that most of the challenges that I've talked about here could have been avoided or at least better negotiated had there been earlier communication with our donor. For example, we may have been able to identify better systems by which to sort Lucille's email from her daughters 
Um, and we may have been able to do earlier and more frequent transfers from a live email account rather than having to work with PFC files. However, as is often the case, um, especially with personal papers, this just wasn't possible here. And we can't build our workflow and policy um, if they rely on us engaging with our donors about email habits. Our efforts at Emory have been to try to develop flexible workflows that use the ideal cases as benchmarks, but which can respond to anticipated challenges without jeopardizing the data. There are certainly lots of challenges associated with archiving email, but imperfect access is better than no access. And my goal moving forward is working out how to provide the imperfect as perfectly as possible. Thank you very much. I thought those were three really terrific uh, presentations. And my job right now is to sort of prime the pump with questions. I presume I really don't have to. I bet that there are a lot of questions out there. I, I heard some audible gasps of recognition um, that of all the problems. I wrote down just a few terms uh, across the three presentations. Um, undisciplined, heterogeneity, dodgy, which is a great term, um, imperfectly available, and Roger's memorable replacement of P-O-O for P-I-I. <laughs> so I guess the key is that across a range of scenarios and volumes, um, email presents a messy world. It's a messy world when you're considering email. So let's get started with, uh, with questions for the panel. I was particularly interested to hear about um, some of the problems with appraisal that you had, having to manually review so many um, messages. Um, I wondered if you had looked at or heard of any topic modeling tools that might be helpful in just at the description phase or at the appraisal phase. Um, if there's anything that you've seen that looks promising, if, even if you haven't had the opportunity to test it yourself. We saw, when we did our RFP process, we saw IBM demonstrate one that had been modeled for, I don't remember, one of the armed services. Um, and it, 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 you can train tools, but it, the, the training takes a lot and lot, a lot of time, and it needs to be very customized for the particular office and environment that you're working in. So we did not feel like that was mature enough for us to um, invest in. And as I said, our collections um, are on a lot, they're, they're on a much smaller scale. Um, so that sort of manual review, it's not desirable and it's not really sustainable, but it's, it's sort of manageable at the moment. We would certainly be interested in sort of further developing um, our use of tools that can do that kind of work for us but we haven't found any yet. <laughs> You're doing your man versus machine. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what we hope. Yeah. I'm in Hello. I'm interested, um, redaction came up for the last panel, but I think it's equally, and was not answered, it's equally as pertinent here and um, from many of the methods that people are using um, for review, I can see redaction at the item level, either the message or the attachment, but I'm wondering about redaction at the, a lower level than that, which would be phrase, word, et cetera. So we don't do we don't do redaction at the University of Michigan. We do we do run it through a a PII finder to take out social security numbers and um, and student IDs and things like that. So we don't. Uh, we do do redaction. Uh, it gets it gets tricky. The 
the PII is the easiest stuff to fund, but we have things where it's not, you're getting into social services, cases, case files, you're getting a lot of different things like that where you really just need to go ahead and do it on the item level. I don't think the phrase uh, thing would really work for us. Maybe it, maybe it will as time goes by, but uh, we just have to go through it individually like that. We haven't been able to find a tool. And we were reviewing on the item level, so it was pretty easy to, <laughs> to redact anything that we needed to. Could you talk a little bit about the man versus machine that you're going to be going for? Um, we've looked a little bit at predictive coding to try to help with that kind of contextual privacy. Um, and what was always asked for that we never had the time to give was sort of ground truth review of a large body of records. It seems like you might have that now with what you've already done. And is that what you're looking for with that? You want to take this, Kathy? Yeah, we are not really supposed to say too much about it at this point, but we are, I think that was the appeal, is that we had the data and we had the processing protocols that Roger did that they can now use our data. Um, we, it did take us a while to find agreement because this it does have privacy protected material in the raw data. So we are actually running, we will be running at our institution and we will be doing it because um, the Attorney General's office was not comfortable with us whipping off a hard drive through the FedEx <laughs> to this, but it, we're hoping that um, basically there are those out there who can develop something using our data set. Because I think that's what was appealing to them was that we did have the actual manual process on it already. Oh, yeah. Um, with regard to uh, particularly the Governor Kane collection, um, I think you said there was quite a bit of spam um, and non-record material in there. Did you delete any of that? And if so or if not, what concerns were expressed with the altering of the email once it was in the possession of the archives? We haven't deleted it. What I was using a, a copy version of it to process, and I would just move it into a folder that were non-records, essentially. We did, I never actually physically deleted it from the copy. Uh, Kathy, I don't know if you want to talk about if we have plans for really for what we're going to do with that stuff. I think that's something we've talked about a lot. We haven't really done anything with it um, because when you think about it, if we got paper, we go to the paper a lot. If we got paper, we'd get rid of it. We'd try it. We'd destroy it. Um, but then you have that, what's the original? Is it, it's not really the original anymore if we go through and make copies and things like that. So um, one of the things that we do have is we had a process for Mark Warner's records. The archivist actually processed all of those records. And I have ex CSV, exports of all the metadata. And I think now um, we're, we have a tool where we can run the actual file names of things that are permanent against that and make duplicate copies. And therefore, we're going to start cleaning up some of those non-record things. So I think the goal is we got to get rid of it. We can't keep it. I mean, there's no point in keeping it. It's safer not to keep it, too, to be honest. So. This, how did this you? Is, uh, this is our last question. We're running up against okay, lunch. Real quick, how did you identify the non-record material in the Kane archive? Uh, it was part art, part science. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It was a, it's a judgment call. You have the re general retention schedules, and, and there's no one place in the code that will list everything that's either a record or a non-record uh, or in the retention schedules. So it, that's why it was pretty much trial and error, making it up as I go along. As I would come across things, I would like, okay, what is this? I'm not sure what it is. And the, the issue you really have, especially with the governor's email for, for Governor Kane, is it specifically states in the code Anything that of a personal or political nature is not a public record subject to the Public Records Act. It's not clear what the relationship is that he, with some of these emails going back and forth. So it's just a judgment call. That's, I, I wish we could make it very much black and white, but in the finding aid, uh, there is a processing note we, we, I was mentioned earlier that just says, well, this is what we did, but it's not perfect. And that's what, that's what we did. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.